I'm redrawing your characters, so listen up, here's how it works. I don't know how well my green screen is working. I could look pretty dumb right now. The people in this video got their characters redrawn through one of two, wait, one of, okay. One, they're patrons who got personalized critique videos made that covered a variety of things that they can work on and improve in their artistic journeys, or they entered the lottery of sorts under the previous video in this series and submitted their characters for free with a small chance of getting in. Both, see, both resulted in the redesigns that we can all learn from in the three-step process of this video. Diagnosis, draw over, and mutation. Feel free to follow either path yourself in the description below with a reminder that novice bard patrons, the people who got their videos made, also get Biko's backpack every month in their mailbox, essentially for free. Ain't that cool? Ain't, ain't it frankly neat? There's something to learn from each of the character studies in this video, and actually, one of them got me stumped. And that's, that's not like a, a tree pun, like I, I struggled, you'll see what I mean. So let's start with Studio Gillian and their character, Mike. Now for our purposes, it could be argued that this character is meant to be a superhero with a microphone theme, but I'm going to approach them as what I'm thinking is more likely, that they're a robot, and at least robotic. There's a lot to like about this character. We're greeted immediately with the vibes of an old-timey radio broadcaster, the microphone mesh on the top of the head, reads as sort of like a, a high-top uh, haircut, and the character is charming and endearing for sure. Now for our diagnosis though, let's take a look at a few artistic principles showcased by the character designs of automatons. Now automatons are robots that are anthropomorphized or resemble humanity, but are still strictly made of almost entirely solid, rigid metallic parts. Think of characters like Ben from Treasure Planet, the Iron Giant, and K2SO. What this means is that any motion or movement to our characters needs to be built into these rigid parts. We can't have a mouth that moves like a human mouth or an arm or leg that flexes like organic tissue because we need to be able to see, at least to a certain degree, the feasible mechanics of our character. That's what ends up making them believable. The conceit and appeal of these characters is that their human likeness or appearance is there despite being inorganic. For Studio Gillian and anyone else that might be learning to draw with constructed cylinders and 3D shapes, it's so important to practice drawing these things so that you can consistently replicate the shapes that they're made from in a variety of angles. Automatons are way more unforgiving than even organic characters are, because your audience needs to be able to see something that retains the same form no matter how they're oriented or posed. The principles of squash and stretch mostly don't apply anymore in these cases. For a character like Mike, anything rigid that's curved will need to stay curved at all times, and features like the eyes and eyebrows need to be given physical constraints that would be mechanically believable. A few other notes, the mic that's inside of the mouth and the amount of colors and detail in the emblems and logo on the chest here could be reduced and simplified down to get rid of some of the visual noise. And then while the long microphone body portion here going to the length of the knees does make the character resemble a microphone, it does make it so that the character can't move as easily. And there's another solution I wanna try here. I also wanna point out this chin shape. While it is possible that this character could have an organically modeled chin, we can insinuate the shape with the 3D construction of the head instead. Finally, clean edges and sharp lines in the right places go a long way in making our automatons straddle that line between human and robot in an appealing way. So I'm compiling the notes that we made from step one and incorporating them into this character's design. Now while the eyes and eyebrows aren't strictly mechanical, same as the original, it could still work. The mouth is also implied to be on a hinge of sorts. Now, sometimes using that cylinder line along the top mic can be a little plain, so I added some curvature that very subtly mimics a hairline for some variety. The IPN logo is simplified down to two clean elements, and finally, the legs are now planed down flat on the inside. So if we wanted to, we could take these legs and stick them together, and you'd have that cylinder shape between them that resembles a microphone. All right, it's time to go a little off the rails with our mutation. What would this character look like if I were designing them? Honestly, I'm on enough of a kick from studying plausible automaton characters that my redesign might not be a 100% good faith take on the original character, and maybe a little does get lost in the translation. This is of course a non-canonical take, but I like the idea of embracing the strengths of mechanical design, giving the character display optic eyes, likely with LED lights showing a variety of expressions. 
These are seated inside of sockets, which makes exchanging a broken eye a bit more believable and gives it some more of that human dimension. The mouth mic is back, this time as a sort of goatee-like chin highlight on the outside of the mouth plate that moves up and down as the character talks. The body and limbs are just a bit more complex, and as character designers, adding those layers of perceivable functionality makes our characters a bit more believable. After all, our mechanics are largely hidden under skin. For a metal, rigid creature, we want to be able to see a bit more of that on the surface. Thanks again to Studio Gillian for submitting your character. Next up is Sal, a longtime patron that supportively comments on almost every video, which I sincerely appreciate. Their character is Maris, a bioluminescent tween crash-landed alien that's being raised by a small community of humans. I love that Sal is able to capture some of the unsure and curious elements you might expect from a human teen, let alone an alien in a new environment. So for step number one, our diagnosis, Sal is looking for some help with making sure the character effectively reads as young as they're supposed to be and any other things that we might be able to come up with. Sal provided a couple of different pieces of art for Maris that all vary in facial structure and body structure, likely from their time iterating on the character. Now, certain faces like this one easily capture that tween age range, and for other faces that read a bit older, all we'd really need to do is adapt some of those proportions that go along with a youthful face. So we push some of the features downwards to free up a bit more of the forehead. We make sure the head is still slightly larger than it would be proportionally for an adult, because they're still kind of growing. And we retain those leftover features of adolescence like larger eyes and some baby fat around the cheeks and jaw. An alien fish out of water that's unsure about the new world they're discovering is a pretty strong parallel to a young teenager overwhelmed by their new, rapidly changing life and circumstances. Now we can talk all day long about how to make them visually appear more like a human young person, but a lot of the best communication of who this character is will come from their body language. Disney's Tarzan is curious about the bizarre new people in his jungle. Deet is wide-eyed, awestruck, and innocent upon setting out into the larger world. If we parallel another aspect of human adolescence in body language, the character can be gawky, uncomfortable, and clumsy in their own skin, something that can easily be explained by a change in atmosphere or gravity from where the character is used to. So for our draw over, what do we actually change about the design? Well, this is where I got stumped. In fact, most of the characters in this video series take quite a lot of time to redesign, but Procreate says the estimated time that I spent on Maris here was over 13 hours. This was over the course of a couple of days, and if you're doing the math like I am, 7,000 views ain't really leveling out that free labor, so how about helping out the old watch time and engagement on this series? So why did it take so long? Well, this video isn't about me, but maybe you can relate to this feeling. There's been times where I thought it'd be fun to, say, go back to art from when I was 10 or 12 years old and instantly improve it, like that. Then, in the process of digging out an old sketchbook and finding the solution to improvement wasn't as cut and dry as I expected, I get a case of the old mental hiccups. I might even spiral, going like, am I even better than I was then? The answer is almost definitely yes, but a mix of underestimating a task and not having a clear objective tends to stretch a project out for me. Now, Sal has made art excellingly better than a 10-year-old here, so much so that at first, I wasn't sure what sort of value I could bring to this redesign. They did a really good job of creating a character that we could sort of call comic realistic. I went through one full redesign process, draw over and mutation, that I just wasn't happy with, until I finally figured out what my purpose with this specific character was, which was to make more dynamic and stylized shapes. That way, no matter what Sal took away from the exercise, there would be something there to pull on. So we're implementing those changes to the face that we mentioned to make Maris more adolescent. And in this version, her body language is a lot more unsure and hands are sort of pulled together. Not to say the character can only be more shy or scared or something, we just want this particular pose to infuse some of that body language. The colors also pull a bit closer toward a warm green tone, and maybe most importantly, we have a smaller torso overall, which cascades its proportional change through the rest of the character. For the clothing, I love the idea of bulkier layers that were draping and pulling downwards, and maybe even tattered in areas. 
naturally the more animalistic limbs where there's essentially a very long segment past the ankles helps sell that gangly teen proportion and posture. So for my mutation, I changed a few things and experimented with a different colorway, this time pulling toward a bioluminescent blue. I also wanted more parts of the character to have that blue peeking through, both in the eyebrows and in freckle-like spots along the limbs. Her eyes are also inverted here so that the bioluminescence glows through them. I also experimented with bulkier forearms here just to make sure it's very clear that this character is alien. Ultimately, iteration helped here, and while there's no universe where I replaced the character, hopefully I had something meaningful enough to say with this take. Thanks, Sal. It's time again for an illustration break, really more of a rendering break. Adrian sent over both the line art of their cool badger character here as well as their attempt at rendering it. So let's take a look. So Adrian seems to be using a multiply layer here and cutting back into the character to carve out some light, which is a good process. However, we're stumbling into a mistake I used to make all the time as I was starting out with shading and painting, and that's to create a shadow on the edge of just about every shape of color. The thing is, light isn't really concerned about lines like this, and this sort of rim of shadow along something like the sleeve and vest isn't really what's happening in real life. It actually serves to flatten any dimension that we might be trying to add to our image. Now, thankfully, since Adrian sent over their flat image, I won't be going through the process of removing the lines, but seeing what we can do to treat this image with some more dimension. First, we can start with where we imagine our light source is coming from in this upper right-hand corner here. And starting with that multiply layer was the right choice. So we can cut light away from it a bit more generally, and we'll treat our character like a 3D object. Some things aren't being hit by as much light, some elements are casting more shadow on other elements. Next, we can add some softer, more general shadow that shows that the closer to our light source something is, the more intense the light is. And we don't need to go crazy with layers of light, but I've got an add layer that's turned way down in opacity here. And we're gonna use that to start hitting some areas with more intense light. Then I'm doing that again more sparingly for some highlights. In this case, less is definitely more with our light. Painting and rendering is its own skill to build up, and Adrian's well on their way. Thanks again. So I only put up the submission form for your characters a few weeks ago now, and uh, a, a whole lot of people sent their stuff in. So thank you for the nearly endless content that would provide where time and money no longer constructs, and I will do my best to pick the best ones for the channel. Not saying the best, not saying yours isn't good if it isn't picked, it's just what makes for good and entertaining and educational content for the most people. First up is Maxis, who sent in their very cool character, Morgan. Maxis sent in just one image of their character, which, while legible, does leave some room to wonder what the character either looks like from other angles or acts like in other poses. This is a character that passes what I call the squint test. When you squint at them, everything looks right. It's just that when you look up close that there's things like construction and lines that aren't really serving the dimensionality of the character. We also have a lot of shapes that are kind of stacked together. We have the legs overlapping one another, this fist is overlapping the, the body there, the hair is of course overlapping and everything is straight on. So it'd be nice to pull some of those things apart so we get a clearer shape read in the silhouette. For our redesign, I'm actually going to stay pretty conservative. Instead of changing anything up too much, I will take most of what's working and try a new pose, mainly changing the size of our torso and shortening it up a bit. I'm also going to make sure that there's just a little more real estate on the face that serves as visual rest. That way there's room for expression. This character is really cool and hopefully my version did them justice. Thanks again, Maxis. If you want your characters looked at, submit via the form below or guarantee feedback on your art via Patreon where you'll also get Vico's backpack. For a thorough character design course, check out Learn Character Design, and otherwise YouTube thinks you should watch this video next. Thanks for watching and have fun creating.